changed or transformed and they're going to receive glorious immortal bodies and they're going to ascend to heaven with Christ. But what about the unbelievers? It's a very good question and the Apostle Paul answers that question in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica about the dead in Christ rising first. And then he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and to you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not know God and those that don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, who will be punished with everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, they'll be destroyed or consumed with the brightness of his coming. So what happens to unbelievers? Christ returns, the righteous dead, the believers are resurrected, they receive glorious immortal bodies, they're caught up in the sky with the living to meet Jesus. The wicked who are alive at that time, according to the Bible, the text that I just read, are destroyed with the brightness of Christ's coming. Um, somebody asked the question, uh, oh, what is the problem? They say, Pastor Finley, um, I believe in Jesus, but I'm really nervous about him coming back. In other words, here's a person that says, I'm a Christian, I'm committed to Christ, I believe in him, but I'm really nervous about his return. I think the reason the person would feel that way is because they, um, they don't feel they'll be ready for Christ's coming. They feel Christ is gonna come, but, and, they, and they believe in Jesus, but they're afraid they might be lost when he comes. And the answer to that is found in 1 John chapter five. The Bible says there is no fear in love there is no fear in love. So when you really are in love with Jesus and your life is transformed by Jesus, it's your best friend that's coming to take you home. So Christ is not coming to destroy the world primarily. He's coming to gather his people home. He's coming to bring them back to heaven. And that's what scripture says. So we need not fear the second coming of Christ. The only people that fear the second coming of Christ are unbelievers. But for believers, when Christ comes, it's the greatest hope of the world. There's no sickness, suffering, sorrow. Jesus comes to deliver us. Um, I have a couple questions here about uh, baptism. Here's a question about baptism. Uh, Pastor Mark, um, I would like to look forward to being baptized like Jesus, but what are the criteria? How does one prepare for baptism? What does baptism really mean? In the New Testament, you remember when the Ethiopian was studying the Bible and God sent Philip to him. And Philip said to him, do you believe? And he said, yes, I believe. Do you believe in Christ? Yes, I do. So the first step in being prepared for Bible baptism is a commitment to Jesus where Jesus changes your life. The second step is understanding the teachings of Jesus. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go teach them and, uh, and teach them the things I've commanded. So there are really three steps in being baptized. Number one, a person comes to the place where they repent of their sins and they believe in Jesus and they love him with all their heart and they wanna serve him. Second, they understand the basics of Christian faith. They understand the basics of the Bible. The Bible doesn't say go baptize, it says go make disciples or go teach all nations. So there's this teaching process where people understand the significance of what it means. And thirdly, when they were baptized in the New Testament, it says they became part of the fellowship of the believers of the church. So when you're baptized, you come to Christ, you understand his word or his truth and you become part of his Bible believing, commandment keeping people on earth. And so baptism is a symbol that I've come to Christ, that I 
have understood his word and that I desire to be part of the community, the, the fellowship of believers. If you have some more questions, be sure to write them out. We will not get to every question every night, but we sure will be getting to your questions as they come. Let me tell you about what's coming up. Can you believe that we only have one more week in our meetings? Aren't, isn't this series going quite fast? This is the end of our second week, and uh, we have next week is our last week. So my wife and I will be with you next week, so you want to be sure to invite your friends. Still time to do that, and want to be sure to join us for next week's series. Um, we have meeting, next meeting here is on Sunday. So next meeting here is on Sunday, 7 o'clock. Next meeting Sunday, no meeting here on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night. So, but Sunday night is our next meeting. On Sunday night, 7.15, Charles is going to give a concert. So we have a special concert by Charles. Are you going to look forward to Charles's concert? I know you will. Invite your friends. Charles will give about a 20-minute concert, 7.15. And then my Bible lecture is a 6,000-year-old remedy for stress. Wow. Any stressed people in Dublin? There sure are. A 6,000-year-old remedy of stress or a relic discovered in the Garden of Eden. We're going to go back and look at how God set aside a special day as a day to rest, a day to worship. And uh, we're going to look about how down through the ages, God's special day has been a day where we can re relax from stress and anxiety and come to worship him and praise him. So Sunday night is a big night. Sunday night will be a concert time with Charles and guest night. You invite your guests, invite your friends on Sunday night. And then it will, in addition to that, be a great lecture on dealing with God's way of dealing with stress in your life and how his special day of worship enables us to be free from that stress and anxiety that so often tears us down in life. Then on Monday night, revealing history's greatest religious cover-up. I'm going to talk Monday night about an attempted change in God's law. It's probably one of the most shocking presentations I'll give here in Dublin, so be sure to be with us on that Monday night. Also on Monday night, my wife is going to have a nutrition lecture. Many of you are interested in and have been just excited about the health presentations, and she's going to be talking about good nutrition and how to live longer and some of the natural foods that God has prepared for us and uh, then on, uh, she'll be dealing with this throughout this coming week and uh, on varied nights. And she'll tell you a lot more about it on, on Monday night. But Monday night, you're going to look forward to the, that presentation on good nutrition. One more week next week. But tonight, Charles, we're going to be talking about God's grace and how God's grace transforms our lives and leads us into obedience and to keep his law. How God's grace makes us new people. We come to Jesus just like we are, but we don't stay like we are. So Charles, come and sing about the grace of God. Grace is greater than our need. Grace is not only unmerited favor, but grace is the power of God to transform our lives. So much to the point that we begin to act and think like Jesus. It is character that is formed after the likeness of Christ. It's the only thing that we can take from down here to up there. So be encouraged as we talk about the power of God's grace in this song. His grace is greater than our failures. His peace runs deeper than our fears. If we go to him for mercy our hearts can rest a 
assured his love will keep us through our tears he'll give us strength to simply trust him through times we may not understand And in our lives are safely in his hands. than our need. No height nor depth in all creation can reach beyond His love for me. His power has raised my spirit, a work forever done with praise. His power has raised my spirit, a work forever His great You're going to look forward to Charles's concert on Sunday, aren't you? be inviting your friends 715 Sunday night for a concert by Charles Hagebrooks. You will enjoy it, you'll be blessed, and your friends will be blessed as well. So don't miss that on Sunday night. Now remember, right after the meeting tonight, I want to meet right up front with those who may struggle with particular habits. That habit may be alcohol, that may, habit may be tobacco, that habit may be overeating, and we'll share with you um, some material on how to have victory over those habits. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the fact that your grace is greater than all our needs. As we open your word tonight, as we go into another one of our lectures, give us insight, but most of all, grant to us your power. May we sense our lives being changed. In Christ's name, amen. 
Tonight, my topic is Europeans' crumbling moral values. Why is it that the moral values in the Western world seem to be falling apart? Things that used to be able to count on, you can't count on anymore. Morals that used to be quite certain or secure seem not to be certain or secure anymore. You lock your bike and you come out <coughs> and that lock is cut and your bike is gone. You know, you wouldn't expect that. You park your car and somebody robs your car. Somebody comes in and robs your house. Uh, you, you, you look at society today and you look at the corruption in corporate corruption uh, that is just out of control today in our society. And you look at the immorality, the sexuality that's out of control. You go down to the pubs and you see people drinking and making irrational decisions. Where is our world headed? And why is it that these things seem to be so out of control and the moral values of our society falling apart? Let's go back tonight. We're going to go back to ancient Rome and take a glimpse at some of the things that were happening back there in ancient Rome and notice very many similar factors between ancient Rome and tonight. In most estimates are that in Rome, the peak population in the first and second century ranged from about 450,000 people to 3.5 million people. But most historians believe that about a million to a million and a half people lived in the capital city of the Roman Empire, Rome. Augustus Caesar said this. He was the first emperor of Rome. He said, I found Rome a city of bricks and lift, left it a city of marble. Augustus Caesar was one of the great builders of Rome, and uh, he was just a fantastic builder and made Rome the capital of the entire empire in one of the most magnificent cities of the world. When you travel to Rome today, you still see the temple of Caesar and still the ruins of that temple. It must have been a lavish temple just as you look at the ruins there. This was the palace of the Emperor Domitian at Palatine Hill. You remember the Emperor Domitian was the emperor that claimed that he was God. He was the only living emperor that claimed that he was God. Many of the emperors claimed that they were God after they died. But Domitian, while he was living, claimed he was God. In fact, letters that Domitian wrote, he would say, he would address those letters, your Lord and God writes to you. This is the Basilica of Constantine. Constantine was a Roman emperor who was a pagan and became a Christian. But under Constantine, many, many pagan practices came into the church. Constantine, in his pagan days, was a worshiper of the sun god, and it seems that he could never let the sun god go. On one side of his coins, he had the sun god. The other side, he had Jesus. This is the Roman Forum, and what's left of it, you walk through it today, and it was the ancient marketplace. It was kind of like downtown Dublin, where you had the sales taking place there in ancient Rome. Of course, today, the Vatican dominates the uh, Rome, and uh, you always see it in the background. But here's the coming down into the, the Forum, the Tiber River, really makes the city a very beautiful one, a very tranquil one. And Rome is even an idyllic city today if it wasn't for so much traffic and so much horns that are, are honking. The Roman aqueducts were a modern marvel of engineering and they could bring the water from far away places into the city so it, these million people who lived in Rome had adequate water supplies. The Colosseum had, was capable of seating 80,000 spectators. It was used for gladiator contests and other warlike games. What was life like in Rome? We've looked a little bit at the archaeology of Rome and we've seen some of the ruins, but what was life like? If you lived in Rome in the first century, what was life like there then? And how do you compare that to life, say, in Dublin today? Well, first the Colosseum, 80,000 spectators. This Colosseum could be flooded and you could actually have boat battles in the Colosseum. Um, but they used it a lot for gladiator contests and warlike games. The Romans loved their games. The Romans loved their sports. The Romans were sport crazy. 
Now, the more brutal the game was, the more the Romans seemed to love it. They loved brutality. So in the gladiator matches, if one gladiator was knocked to the ground, the other gladiator would put his foot on his throat and he would take his sword, getting ready to slit his throat so the blood would flow in the sands. If the crowd pointed up like this, the gladiator would slay the individual. If they pointed down, they would be spared. So you look at the great gladiator uh, events and the more gory it was, the bloodier it was. You know, we have a movie in modern times called The Gladiator, but the Romans had the real thing. What was life like? Life was filled with sport activities. It was filled with violence and murder. It's been estimated that about 500,000 people and a million wild animals died in the Colosseum Games. And so this was a very violent time, a bloody time. Um, it was a time of human life regarded with astonishing indifference. H.G. Wells, one of the historians of Rome, said Rome was content to feast, exact, grow rich, watch its gladiatorial games without the slightest attempt to learn anything of the lands that it ra raped. The Romans loved these great parties. They loved great feasts. In fact, sometimes the feasts would last for months and there would be little brass basins and a feather. So after a person had eaten, everything possible that you could eat and they were just so filled they would take their little basin go into another room that was uh, set aside for this they'd stick a feather down their throat and they would vomit just to come back to eat more we've discussed the archaeologists have discovered some of the menus in rome one of the menus was at the end of your meal you would take a little pink mice that was alive hold it by the tail dip it in honey swallow it alive, this little pink mouse, so that you could throw up or vomit so you could go back and eat more food. So what were the Romans like? They loved sports, they loved music, they loved feasts, they loved eating. This is the Circumus Maximus where they had their horse races. The Romans loved horse races and there would be 120,000 people that would watch these horse races. Edward Gibbon was the leading historian of the Roman Empire, and this is what Gibbon said. But the most lively and splendid amusement of the idle multitude depended on the frequent exhibition of public games and spectacles. The impatient crowd rushed at dawn of day to secure their places. In other words, they stood up in lines to get to these sporting events. They had to get in. They had to get a ticket. And the happiness of Rome appeared, the historian said, to hang on the event of the race. So if their horse lost, if their team lost, the whole city would be depressed. Are you getting a picture of ancient Rome? Ancient Rome dismissed the idea of a personal God. Ancient Rome filled with sports. Ancient Rome filled with feasts. Ancient Rome filled with activities. Ancient Rome's emotion went up or down, whether their sports team won or lost. There was a lot of immorality, sexuality, a lot of drinking taking place in ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, there, were, there was a great deal of lawlessness and robbery. This is a third century uh, relief or marvel of the chariot races in ancient Rome. And you always had, they always had their favorite chariot teams. These are the baths of Tacola. In these baths, homosexuality took place uh, very openly. Homosexuality was very open in ancient Rome, one of the Roman baths. Prostitution was very common at these feasts. The Roman lords would get their favorite prostitutes and bring them to that feast. Why did Rome fall when it was the mightiest of all nations? Rome fell because of the fact it decayed within. There was a moral decay in Rome where their love for pleasure, their immorality, their love for sporting activities, there was no moral compass, there was no right or wrong. People determined right and wrong by their own thinking process. One historian said, here are seven reasons why 
Rome fell. One, it was filled with luxury and wealth, and they were more interested in luxury and wealth than work. Two, it was a pleasure-mad, amusement-centered culture. Three, it was immersed in sports and entertainment. Four, it was an immoral, sex-centered society. Five, it was a brutal, violent society. Six, it overextended itself militarily. It had a very weak army. Eventually, its army went all over the place and couldn't defend its own country. And seven, it was overextended financially. Can you see any of those things taking place in modern Europe and the United States and the Western world today? Are we very similar in a lot of ways to the Roman Empire? Very similar in our desire and wealth has become a god. We're a pleasure-mad society, crazed, immersed in sports, an immoral, sex-centered society, often a vital, brutal society. We may not have the Colosseum, but we sit on our televisions and watch war things and uh, people blown apart and blasted apart and seem to enjoy that. Um, we're a society that often overextends itself financially. We spend more money than we, we bring in. So many of these things in ancient Rome we see today. Something is fundamentally wrong with our society. Moral standards, which were once rock solid, are now non-existent. Something is fundamentally wrong when you see a moral decay taking place in society. In his book, The Rise and Fall of American Civilization, or you could say The Rise and Fall of European Civilization, Richard Lamb says this, for freedom to be workable as a political system, there has to be strong inner controls. There has to be a powerful moral compass and a sense of values. And here's what he argues. He says we've lost that moral compass. We've lost that sense of values in our society. You see, our society has largely turned its back on God's moral standards. Our society largely says right and wrong is a matter of your thinking process. What's right to you may not be right to me. What's wrong to you may not be wrong to me. There's no objective standard. The, the idea in society today is simply leave people alone. You do your thing, let me do my thing, let everybody be persuaded in their own mind. The idea today is that whatever you think or feel do, when you take that position, it's like having a compass and being lost in the woods and not knowing where north is, south is, or east is, or west is. And the fact of the matter is, in our society today, we've thrown away our moral compass. And when you throw away the moral compass, you end up with confusion, and you end up with a society that is crumbling in its very foundation. The Bible is very clear when it talks about our society, and it talks about what's going on right now. The Bible says this, Hosea chapter 8, Hosea the prophet says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. If you sow the wind of alcoholism, you're going to reap the whirlwind of broken families. If you sow the wind of sexual immorality, you are going to reap the whirlwind in your society of sexually transmitted diseases. If you sow the wind of crime and violence, you're going to reap the whirlwind of instability in society. They've sowed the wind and they're reaping the whirlwind. When we look at what's happening in Western society today, we're reaping the results of a society that has cast off God's law and makes the mind the human standard. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 says, read it with me, please. Let's read it together. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. In other words, God's word says, if you cast off my standard, and if everybody does their own thing, and everybody does what they think feels good, and everybody does what they personally enjoy, if it feels good, do it. If that's your attitude, then he who trusts in his own heart is a fool because there are certain moral standards, just like there are scientific laws. If I step off this stage, you think I'm going up? I'm not going up. I'm going what? Down, because the law of gravity says that you go down. There are certain natural laws in our society that operate all over the world. 
but there are also moral laws. Those moral laws are found in God's Ten Commandments. They're found written with God's own finger on tables of stone. These Ten Commandments were not simply written for an ancient Jewish civilization. These Ten Commandments are the moral code for society. They are really pathways for happiness, rightly understood. They spell out how happy, joyous people live. Just think if there were no Ten Commandments at all. Let's suppose there were no commandment that says thou shalt not steal. And let's assume that anybody could break into your house and take whatever they wanted and there was no police department to protect that. Let's suppose there was no commandment that said thou shalt not commit adultery and anybody could come and take any woman and do what they wanted to do. You see, the Ten Commandments are the very basis. They're the very foundation of all morality in all society. Psalm 111, verse 7 to 9 says, The works of his hands are verity and justice. Verity means truth. So God's works of his hands, that Ten Commandment law that he wrote with his hands, are works of truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. He has commanded his covenant forever. So when God gave the Ten Commandments, they were to guide humanity. They were to give direction to all humanity in every generation, forever and ever and ever and ever. They were not simply limited in time. They were not simply for Old Testament Jews. They are the moral foundation of society. We turn our back on those Ten Commandments and all society crumbles and our personal lives crumble as well. Do you know that the United States took a survey? I have to laugh at my country at times because America takes survey or poll after poll after poll after poll. So somebody got the bright idea. Let's take a survey on Big Mac hamburgers. You have McDonald's in Dublin? You know, how do you know? You go there? Come to Miss Finley's nutrition class on Monday. She'll take care of you on that one. All right. So some crazy American, it would take some crazy American to do this, took a survey on Big Mac and the Ten Commandments. This is what they found out. A new survey shows, I read this in the newspaper, can you imagine? A new survey shows more Americans can name the seven ingredients in a McDonald's Big Mac hamburger than the Ten Commandments. I mean, that you talk about craziness in our society. Look at this. The survey found that 45% could recall the commandment, honor your father and mother. Of these Americans, only 45% knew the commandment, honor your father and mother. 76% remembered that a Big Mac had lettuce. What kind of bun does a Big Mac have? 76%, 75% knew it was a sesame seed bun. And only 45% knew that one of the commandments was honor your father and mother. The thing that's really a knockout is this to me. 62% of the people in America surveyed remembered that Big Macs have pickles. Well, my, that is really earth-shaking, isn't it? And only 45% remembered the commandment, honor your father and your mother. You see, what's going on in our society today is we, we messed up our values. When a Big Mac becomes more important to you than the Ten Commandments, something is incredibly wrong with our society. You know, the Ten Commandments speak with relevance and meaning to the 21st century. That first commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3 to 17 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In an age where our money has become gods and our credit cards have become gods and TV idols have become gods and sports heroes have become gods and our cars have become gods. The commandment speaks with relevance and it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. At a time that we make images, images of other human beings in the sense that they become our idols. In, when we make images of our cars and they become our idols and we make graven images of clothes and we become fashion crazy in that kind of 
society. The Ten Commandments still speak and says, Thou shalt not make into thee any graven image. And at a time when we drag the name of Jesus in the dust, and you go to any pub and you hear people cursing and swearing and using the name of Jesus in vain, there is still a commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And at a time of stress and anxiety, in a time when people have forgotten the true Bible Sabbath, God still says, Remember, because He knew we would forget the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou do all thy labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. There is still a command calling us back to worship, still a command calling us back to know God, still a command calling us back to recognize that He created us. The Ten Commandments speak with meaning, they speak with purpose, they speak with relevance. At a time when many children dishonor their parents, there's still a command that says, honor your father and the mother and respect them. At a time when human life is disregarded and bombs drop indiscriminately by governments killing thousands and when the unborn are not protected and abortion is uh, commonplace in many countries, there's still a commandment that says thou shalt not kill. There's still a commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery, that God has created a man and a woman to live together in marriage and not have sexual relationship outside of that bond. You see, the commandments speak with relevance. They give us meaning, purpose. What do these commandments say? Honor thy father and mother says, respect your family. Thou should not kill says, respect life. And love life. Enjoy life. Thou shalt not commit adultery says, love and experience genuine love. You see, every one of these commandments are the very foundation of life itself. The commandment that says, thou shalt not steal says, respect each other's property. The commandment that says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor says, Respect the truth. Thou shalt not covet. Be thankful for what you have. You see, the commandments of God are not some legalistic requirements. They're not something written by a God who wants to restrict our freedom. They rather are given to you and to me by a God who wants to protect that freedom. A God who wants to preserve that freedom. God's law is the foundation of God's very throne. God's law is his eternal moral standard, which defines sin and establishes our accountability to God. You see, if you do away with the law of God, you say the law of God is irrelevant. You really do away with sin then. What does the Bible say? 1 John 3 verse 4. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Other translations say sin is the transgression of or the breaking of God's law. So I may think, or somebody may think, stealing is okay. Oh, I, I don't have as much as you. You have more than me, and I can take from you. Somebody has that idea. But one of the commandments says, thou should not steal. We don't define sin. God does. Somebody says, well, adultery, well, well that's... That, that's not that bad. Everybody else is doing it. But you don't define sin. God does. He says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Some, you know, the commandment that says, thou shalt not kill, doesn't only refer to killing somebody else. It refers to killing yourself. And I don't simply mean suicide by shooting yourself in the head with a gun. What I mean is if you are destroying your body by alcohol or tobacco, you're destroying your body by drugs. You're violating that commandment that says thou shalt not kill because you're killing yourself slowly by the habits of your life. And so God says thou shalt not kill. You say, well, it's my body. I can do whatever I want with it. But God's commandment defines sin. Sin is not something I define in my mind. God defines it. Why? Because he wants you to be happy. He wants me to be happy. He wants us to enjoy life incredibly. Sin is breaking God's law. And God defines what sin is. And his great goal for your life is to live this incredibly abundant life. God's law is the pathway to freedom. It's the pathway to genuine happiness. The Ten Commandments do not take away our freedom. They give us freedom. James says this, chapter 2, verse 12. James writes, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of what? The law of what, everybody? What does it say? Oh, I didn't hear you. The law of what? Liberty. What does liberty mean? What's liberty? Liberty is freedom. So God's law that judges us is a law of what? Freedom. Because when by God's grace you keep 
God's law, you are free from the bondage and the tyranny of sin. You see, somebody said, if I love Jesus, isn't that enough? Love always leads to obedience. It never leads to disobedience. Love doesn't lead us to disobey the commandments. It leads us to obey the commandments. What did Jesus say? Read it again with me, please. John 14, verse 15. These are words of Jesus. Read them. If you love me, keep my commandments. Did Jesus say, if you love me, you don't have to keep my commandments? Did Jesus say, if you love me, forget about my commandments? If, did Jesus say, if you love me, it doesn't make any difference? What does Jesus say? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Do you love him tonight? How many of you love Jesus tonight? Can I see your hands? Sure. And what does he say? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. See, I obey God not in order to be saved, but because I am saved. Somebody says, well, pastor, I'm a Christian. I've come to Christ, and I understand I'm saved by grace. You are saved by grace. The grace of Christ that saves you, pardons you, gives you mercy, but it also gives you power to live an obedient life. So I come to Christ and I obey him. I come to Christ and he gives me the power to obey. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Now by this we know, notice not we guess, we think that we know him. What is the evidence that we know God? The evidence that we know God is if we keep his commandments. It's like a little boy, and the little boy says, Oh, Daddy, I love you. Oh, Daddy, I love you. Oh, Daddy, I love you. And the, and the father says to his little nine or ten-year-old son, Would you take out the trash bin? And the, and the boy says, No, Daddy, I want to play with my trucks. Oh, Daddy, I love you. Oh, Daddy, I love you. Would you take out the trash? Oh, uh, Daddy, I love you. Dad, would you take out the trash? I don't love you that much, Daddy. You see, the Bible says, if we, this is the evidence that we know him. See, love is always manifest in action. Love always finds its expression in what we do. Love is not some silly emotional thing, but love is tangible. So that when we have a deep love for Christ, and we really know him, we, we desire to keep his commandments. And our obedient lives are the testimony of what Christ has done inside of us. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a what? Is a what? I don't want to be a liar, do you? Is a liar, and the truth is where? The truth is where? It's not what? In him. So if we say, I know Christ, if we say, I really know Christ, but forget about the commandments, I'm going to live the way I want, according to the Bible, we are a what? Liar, and the truth is not where? in us. You see, grace and law are not contradictory ideas. Many, many Christians really get mixed up on this one. And they have the idea that grace is one thing and law is another thing. In fact, there are some people that have the idea that law is part of the Old Testament, but when Jesus came, grace is part of the New Testament. The Bible does not teach that contradiction. What's the role of God's law and what's the role of grace? Let's see if we can discover it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what the function of the law is, God's law reveals to me what sin is. The law defines sin. If there is no law, you don't know what sin is. If there is no law against going 130 kilometers an hour, or 100 miles an hour through the center of Dublin, you cannot be prosecuted for speeding in your car if there's no law against it. So if there is no law, there's no knowledge of sin. Because there is a speed limit, a speed law, if you violate that, you're subject to being arrested and being fined. The law of God defines what sin is. The law reveals our need. The law is like a mirror. Let's suppose I'm out and I am working on my car. I have the bonnet of the car up. You know, I always get confused between English terms, Irish terms, and American terms. In America, we call it the hood of the car. That's where the engine is. What do you call it here? You call it the bonnet? The bonnet. Okay, now I have the same language. Now, so let's suppose this bonnet of my car is open and I'm working on, the, on, my, on my engine. And I'm working there, and I got my hands are grimy, and I touch my nose 
that gets all, all oily. Then I touch my forehead, that gets all oily. I touch my chin, that gets all oily. I touch my cheek, that's all oily. Then I hear my wife calling, darling, it's time for lunch. I've made a wonderful meal, and I come in the house. And she says, uh, Mark, you got, you got grease on your nose. You got, you got, uh, you got grease on your cheek. You got, I don't have any grease there. What, what, what are you talking about? I don't have any grease there. What does she say to me? You got grease there. Go look in the mirror. So I go and look in the mirror, and what do I know? Well, she's right all the time, right? I look in the mirror, and I see here's that grease. What is the function of the mirror? The function of the mirror is to tell me my face is dirty. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull the mirror off the wall, trample it and smash it, and everything's going to be okay with my face, right? What do you think? If I do away with the mirror, will that solve the problem with my face? I need a mirror to look in to tell me my face is dirty, but I need some soap and water to do what? To cleanse or wash it. God's law is like the mirror. You look in God's law and you see that you haven't always had pure thoughts. And you've violated not only the commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery physically, but you violate it mentally. You've been immoral. You see that at times you haven't killed a person, but you got angry with them. You see that the law is so broad that it deals with your thoughts as well as your actions. You see that at times you've coveted what other people have had. You see at times you've been disrespectful. You see at times that you haven't worshipped God and you've broken his Sabbath. You look in the mirror of God's law and you see at times that there have been other gods before you beside God, that you put other things before God in your life. And you get on your knees and you say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, forgive me. And he comes into your life. The mirror of his law has showed you how you've looked. And then you get on your knees and you pray and his grace cleanses you. And his grace washes you clean. And you're forgiven by that grace. And you get a new start in Christ. You become new in Jesus. There's a new smile on your face. There is a new sparkle in your eyes in Christ. You see, if there is no law, then there is no sin. Because the law defines what sin is. The Bible says, by the law, there's a knowledge of sin. If there is no sin, there is no grace. Because the reason we need grace is because we've sinned, because we've broken God's law. So if you do away with the law, you do away with sin. If you do away with sin, you do away with the need for grace. If there is no grace, there is no need for the cross. Because the cross came to give us grace because we sinned, because we broke God's law. So no law, no sin. No sin, you don't need grace. If you don't need grace, there's no need for the cross. If there is no need for the cross, there is no salvation. Because we broke God's law, that we have sinned, we need grace, grace comes through the cross, and the cross provides for us salvation. If there's no need of grace and the cross and salvation, then there is no savior. So if you do away with the law, you do away with sin. You do away with sin, you do away with the need for grace. You do away with the need for grace, you do away for, with the cross. You do away with the cross, you do away with salvation. You do away with salvation, you do away with, do away with the need of a savior. So it is only as you understand the law that you can fully understand your need of a savior. Now, what's the role of grace? We've seen the role of the law is to reveal sin. The law tells us what sin is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So salvation comes not because we obey the law, but salvation comes because we reach out by grace. And Jesus changes us by his grace. He makes us over again by his grace. He gives us that gift. You know, one night I was way up in the mountain areas of the Philippines, and I was, had my Bible open, and I was on a dirt road, and there was a little table there, and uh, there was a lantern. And I had this Indian tribe come out of the mountains 
and it was way back in the mountainous area of the Philippines, and uh, I love to go to the Philippines and, uh, and share Jesus' word, but this time I was way back, and this tribe came out, I was on a dirt road, it was at night, it was dark, and I was talking to them about Jesus, and I was telling them about how to, what it means to accept Jesus, and I read this Bible passage, for by grace you've been saved through faith, it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God, and I said, God is a gift, he wants to give you salvation. What happens when you have a gift? When somebody offers you a gift, you just have to reach out and take it. And I wanted to illustrate it, and I had a little, little children in the front. They were eight, nine, ten, and I had a comb in my pocket or a pen or something like that. So I took out, let's say it was a pen. I took out the pen and I said to the little boy, because I knew that those Indians, they would love that pen. It was a nice silver pen. They never had a pen like that before. And I handed it to the little boy. I said, take it. It's a gift because I wanted to show him that, that you reach out and take it. And the little boy, when I went down like this, he jumped up, never took it. He ran into the jungle. I came to the next boy. You can have it. Take it. He jumped up, ran into the jungle. You know, he saw this big, large, tall American, and these little Filipino kids were afraid. I said, you take it, take it. He, no, he ran into the jungle. The fourth boy grabbed the thing out of my hand and took off running. And I said, come back, come back. And pretty soon, oh, the parents, you know, they were embarrassed, so they called all the kids back, and the kids came back. And I said to the first little boy, do you have the pen? No, sir. Do you have the pen? No, sir. Do you have the pen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I have it. You can keep it. It's yours. It's a gift. And the other boys kept saying, he gets it. He gets it. Why did I get it? You didn't take it. If you would have taken it, buddy, you'd have had a pen, too. Why did that one boy have it? Because he reached up and took it. You can reach up and take salvation. Salvation is yours. Some will run from it, but some will reach up and take it. There can be two people sitting in the same meeting, one saved and one lost. One reaches up and takes it. The other never takes it. What does scripture say? For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of what? God. So salvation is a gift of God. When we reach up and take it, it is ours in Christ. Now, grace, according to the Bible, is God's mercy for our failures. It's God's pardon. It's God's forgiveness. But it's also God's power. It's God's power to change our lives. So the grace of God not only provides pardon for the past, but the grace of God can make you a new man. It can make you a new woman. See, here's the problem with many in Christianity. They think Christianity is just a head thing. And they got all that they want to argue about Christianity. But when you come to Jesus Christ, he pardons you. He gives you new purpose in life. He gives you new meaning in life. And he changes you. You can be never the same again. Now, does grace do away with God's law? Because we are saved by grace, does that mean we can do whatever we please and God's law is totally, absolutely insignificant? The Apostle Paul talks about that. Romans chapter 3, verse 31, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? In other words, because I'm saved by faith, does that do away with God's law? Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So when I come to Christ and he changes me, he leads me not to disobedience, but to obedience. He leads me not to break God's law, but to keep God's law. I've been giving a series of lectures like this in outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And I was leaving the lecture one day, and I had to get to another appointment. And I knew I needed to get there quite quickly, so I had given the lecture, I had talked about the importance of obedience, I jumped in my car, and I was racing down the road. Has your foot ever got too heavy when you put it on the gas pedal? Has that ever happened to you? My foot got too heavy and I pushed the petrol and my car was going far faster than it should have gone. And I was speeding down the road. As I was speeding down the road, a policeman went like this. And I said to my wife, do you know that man? He's waving at us. She said, darling, he's not waving at us at all. You're in big time trouble because you've been going too fast. This is a true story. So I pulled over to the side of the road and the policeman pulled up beside me. 
Now, I don't know how it is in Ireland, but I know this. If you get pulled over by an American policeman, it's going to cost you about $150. So I don't want to pay any fine of $150. So the policeman pulled me over, looked into the window of my car, and he said, please, sir, give me your license. I went into my wallet, and I pulled out my ministerial license as a pastor. And I handed that to him. He said, no, sir, your driver's license, please. So I gave him my driver's license, and I said, before you write me a ticket, because I know these American policemen, once they start writing you a ticket, they don't stop. You're going to be paying $150, and that's it. So I said, look, sir, before you write me a ticket, can I tell you a story? He said, who in the world is this guy? And I said, he said, yeah, but be quick. I said, I was just at the auditorium, and I was telling people to keep the law. And you and I really work on the same team. You catch them after they break the law, and I try to get them to keep the law. So because we're on the same team, oh, we won, so we give me grace. He looked at me and he said, all right, preacher, this time grace. So I, he took the thing and he didn't even write the ticket. He went and got in his car. So I got in the car and I went as fast as I could. I peeled those tires, and I went fast, and I said to my wife, we're under grace, we're not under the law, we can go as fast as we want. Is that what I said? I got in that car, and I went like this. Kept looking in that mirror with one eye to see if that guy was following me. You know, I kept looking there, looking there, looking there. I mean, I was not going to go over that speed limit. Why not? Why wasn't I going to go fast? What did I deserve? You know, one time I said that to an audience, what do I deserve? And the lady said, death. I said, no, I just sped, lady. I, no, I didn't deserve that. What did I deserve? I deserved a ticket, right? I deserved a ticket. I deserved to go to court and pay $150. But what did the man give me? The man gave me what? Grace. And when he gave me grace, that touched me. So I wanted to be careful that I didn't speed anymore, right? So when you come to Jesus... He gives you grace. He pardons you. But he also gives you his power through that grace to live an obedient life. So you come to Jesus just like you are, but you don't then go back and live like you were living before. You come to him like you are, but you don't stay as you are. When that man gave me grace, you can bet that I did not want to speed off. Why would God send his son to suffer the cruel death of the cross if all he had to do with some stroke of magic was to change his law? I mean, the reason Jesus had to come and die was because we broke the law. But if Jesus was going to change the law, he wouldn't have had to go on through the trouble of dying. He could have just changed the law and readjust the whole concept of justice in the universe, and he wouldn't have had to die at all. But it's because the law of God is the eternal foundation of the throne of God. And to break God's law is to violate the moral ethic of the universe, the way the universe operates. And therefore, Jesus came to meet the demands of justice of a broken law. He died the death we deserve to die, gives us grace to experience salvation, to change our lives so that we could obey his law. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, verse 17, don't think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, I came to fulfill it. Did Jesus come to destroy the law that said, thou shalt not commit adultery? No, he came to fulfill it, expand it. He said, if you even look at a woman with lust, you have uh, broken that commandment. You thought immoral thoughts. He said, did Jesus come to do away with the law that said, thou shalt not kill? He said, no, you've heard, heard it written in the law thou should not kill, but I say to you, don't get angry with a brother without cause. Jesus came to show us the breadth of the law, the exceeding greatness of the law, and our inability to keep it, and therefore to come to him by grace and receive mercy, pardon, and forgiveness, and to receive his strength. The Bible is very plain. You know, Jesus says it through Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. What does this mean? What does it mean to be under the law? What does it mean to be under grace? Some people say if you're under grace, you just don't have to worry about keeping God's law. But notice sin, and what is sin? Breaking God's law, the transgression of the law. Sin won't dominate you. Why not? Because you're not under the law principle. You're under grace. And in the grace principle, you have power to live an obedient life. 
Now, what does it mean to be under the law? It means that you're outside of Christ and you're under the condemnation of the law. It means to be under the law as a method of salvation. In other words, that I try to obey the law vainly in my own strength, I keep failing, and the law which I fail to keep condemns me. What does it mean to be under grace? It means to be under the grace method of salvation. It means that under grace, I accept Christ's pardon. I receive Christ's forgiveness. I'm filled with Christ's power. Here's the incredibly good news. Whatever brought you to this meeting, you can find grace. Christ's grace will forgive you of anything in your past. You can have an incredibly new start. But not only that, Christ's grace, when it enters your life, when you're honest with God, you fall by your bed, and you open your heart to God, and you say, God, grant to me your strength and power. Jesus does that, and you live a new life. The Bible says in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. How does the Lord convert my soul? Because as I look in the mirror of the law, I see that I've fallen, and that drives me to Jesus who changes my life. So the law actually plays a role in conversion because it drives me to Jesus, the living Christ. Now, the entire law can be summarized in one word. What is it? Love. The law is codified love. The law tells me how to love. The first four commandments tell me how to love God. The last six commandments tell me how to love my fellow man. So the entire law can be summarized to love God and love your fellow man. I've had people say, well, Pastor Mark, didn't a Pharisee come to Jesus in the New Testament? And didn't Jesus say there are only two commandments, love God and love your fellow man? And doesn't that mean we just do away with the Ten Commandments? Let's look at the story. This young ruler came to Jesus and he tried to, to um, lead Jesus down a pathway where Jesus himself would contradict the Old Testament. And this man was a lawyer, not a student of uh, civil law, but a student of divine law. And so he's trying to trick Jesus, and he said, what's the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, on these two commandments, that's love God and love your neighbor. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Incidentally, I've had people say, well, Jesus just gives us two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. That's the New Testament rule. Do you know that love God with all your heart, all your soul, that's Old Testament? That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Love your neighbor as yourself is Old Testament, Leviticus 19, verse 18. So Jesus took the summary of the entire Ten Commandment law in the Old Testament, love God, first four commandments, love your neighbor, last six. He took that summary and he said on these two commandments, love God, love your fellow man, hang all the law and all the prophets. In other words, he wasn't doing away with the Ten Commandments, but he was saying that you keep God's law by loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor. If you love God, you're going to not want to have other gods. If you love God, you're not going to want to take his name in vain. If you love God, you want to worship him and keep his Sabbath. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to be stealing from them or, or getting angry and killing them. So love is the essence of law keeping, which leads us to all obedience. Love brings people together. And when you come to Christ, there's grace in your heart. There's love in your life. This is the new covenant. The new covenant is not to do away with the law, Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel, God's people. After those days, says the Lord, I'll put my laws in their mind. I'll write them in their hearts. What does it mean that God's law is in our mind? We know it. What does it mean it's in our heart? We love it. So he says, I'll put my law in their mind. I'll write it in their heart. I'll be their God. They shall be my people. This is the new covenant. The new covenant is that he changes us inside. The new covenant is that he makes us new people. The new covenant is that he breaks the bonds that put us in chains. The new covenant that is he is our deliverer. He liberates us. He sets us free. In Revelation 11, verse 19, John looks up into heaven. Then the temple of God, that's the sanctuary of God, was opened in heaven. The ark of his covenant, that's where the Ten Commandments are, are seen in his temple. So John says, I looked up into heaven and I saw the ark of the covenant. I saw those commandments. And there they become the very foundation of all uh, heaven. They become the foundation of God's throne. You see, God's commands last forever and ever and ever. And when any society turns its back on God's commands, when any society 
loses its sense of a moral compass, when any society uh, only looks to itself in an attempt to live righteously, when we do away with God's commandments, the foundation of society crumbles and shakes because God's law is the very foundation of his throne. The Bible teaches that God will have a last day people that will be so committed to him that all they want to do is please him. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are people that love Jesus. Here are people that want to keep his commandments. Here are people that want to have to be free from the bondage and the slavery of merely living in harmony with their own thought patterns. You know, a number of years ago, I was helping a woman who was really in bondage. She was breaking God's law and she knew it. She was destroying her body. This particular lady was struggling with a smoking habit. Now look, I recognize that smoking is an addiction. It becomes really difficult at times to quit. And we're not here to condemn people, we're just here to help people. But this woman was really convicted by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit kept convicting her and convicting her that she needed to give up smoking. You know, there may be something in your life that you need to give up. There may be some habit in your life that you need to give up. There may be something that is chaining you, something that is putting you in bondage. And this woman, who I'll call Carol, knew that she was in bondage. And she couldn't give this thing up. But there's something in your life that's keeping you in bondage tonight. Something in your life that is chaining you. Do you feel kind of like you're in a prison and you just want to get out? It may be the watching of, of pornographic movies. It may be alcohol. It may be some drug addiction. It may be something like you're overeating and you know it. it may, but there's something that kind of chains you. It may be a mental thing. It may be anger. It may be bitterness towards somebody. This lady knew that the thing that was really binding her was cigarettes. That was the thing that stood between her and God. Now, I don't know what the thing is, and there may be nothing. You may be a committed Christian. Obviously, many of us here are. You love Jesus. But there are some people that have that, that block, that something between them and Jesus. And this lady did. And so she and I sat down, and I, I said to her, you know, in Scripture, Jesus delivered people. He touched the eyes of the blind, and they were opened. He touched the ears of the deaf, and they were unstopped. And I said, you know, there was a man by the pool of Bethesda. He had been there 38 years. And he, the word Beth means house of. Esda means mercy. And Jesus came to that place where the sick and the dying were. He came to that place where the fearful and the hopeless were. He came to that place where people had given up and they were filled with despair. He came. And he saw the most wretched, despicable, hopeless man. Fever had stricken his body. He was shaking from head to toe. For 38 years he had been lying there. And there was a superstition that somebody would stir the water, that an angel would, and whoever gotten first in that pool would be healed. And that man had been lying there and he had seen others in the rush of the crowd step on other sick people and press them down and crush them till their life was gone. He saw the masses rush to that pool because of the superstition. But there was nobody to bring that man to that pool. And he was just lying there dying. And Jesus came and he looked at the man and he said, would you be made well? Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be delivered from this thing? That's what Jesus says to you tonight. He'll never violate your choice. But if there's something that's holding you, something that is destroying you, Jesus says, will you be made well? Is it your choice? Is it what you want? And the man looked up at Jesus, and Jesus knew that he wanted to be made well. And Jesus said, I say to you, in the name of the living Christ, get up and walk. And that man acted upon the word of Christ. He believed the word of Christ. And there was new life in his body. And I said to this woman, Carol, I said, look, Jesus says to you, do you want to be healed of this thing called smoking? I said, let me read you a Bible passage. And we read the passage together. And here it is, 1 John chapter 5. 
It says, this is the confidence that we have in Him. This is the confidence we have in Jesus. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. I said, Carol, do you think it's according to God's will that you give up this habit? Yes, Pastor. Do you believe He can help you? Oh, I don't know, Pastor. I don't think so. Because I've been, I've, I, this habit's gripped me. It's chained me for 20 years. I said, Carol, get your pen. I want you to write something in the Bible. So she got her Bible. I said, Carol, this is what I want you to write. If we ask anything according to His will, now write in the Bible, except quit smoking, He's going to hear us. Because God made a mistake when He wrote the text, so you've got to amend the text. If we ask anything according to His will, except quit smoking. She said, Pastor, I'm not going to write that in my Bible. I said, Carol, do you believe what God says? If we ask anything according to His will, it's God's will to deliver you from alcohol. It's God's will to deliver you from drugs. It's God's will to deliver you from, from bitterness or anger. See, God's grace not only pardons our past, but God's grace gives us a power, a new power in our lives so that we are different. Carol that night made a decision that what God said she believed, that she would look away from herself, and her weakness, and she would look to the strength of the living God. And that night, she was delivered. Amazing grace. The chains are gone. In Christ, our chains are gone. Is there something that's been binding you? Something that's been holding you? Something that tonight, Christ speaks to you and he says, I want to deliver you. Charles is going to come and sing and make this a special moment between you and Jesus. Just bow your head as Charles sings. And whatever that thing is, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. And tell him that you believe that his strength can deliver you.
unending love, amazing grace, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like of love, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine but God who has called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine Jesus is forever mine. Amen. 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 Let's stand and pray. And as we pray, I wonder if there's somebody here that you really say it's you need deliverance. <clears throat> there's some habit, some attitude. There's something that's chaining you, something that's really binding you. And you just want to lift your hand and say, Jesus, deliver me. Jesus, deliver me. Jesus, deliver me. Just lift your hand. You're saying, Jesus, deliver me. Jesus, I believe your grace. Jesus, I believe your power. I believe that you can forgive me. I believe that tonight is the night of new start. Tonight's the night of new beginning. I open my heart to receive your strength, your power. Oh, my Father. Thank you so much that you are the God of grace, the God who does deliver us, the God who grants us power beyond what we can imagine. Lord, we come to you with open hearts. We thank you that you save us by grace and that you save us to be obedient, to live godly lives. We acknowledge openly that we cannot do that on our own, that we're weak, but you're incredibly strong. And so we come to you just now, we come with the habits of our lives, and we really pray that you'd break the chains that bind us. We believe that you will and you can, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Remember, our next meeting is on Sunday evening. That Sunday evening, our next meeting, we're talking about a 6,000-year-old remedy for stress. We're talking about worship as outlined in the Garden of Eden. You won't want to miss that presentation. And uh, we're talking about God and, and the final conflict on Earth's history over worship. You won't want to miss that. Charles is going to give a concert at 7.15. So invite your friends. Charles will be in concert. Then I'll speak Monday night, of course, on Nutrition Night. Now, those of you specifically who are interested in, for you personally, learning how to overcome habits in your life, just come up and sit here. The meeting is over, but I'm going to spend a little time with those of you that need to overcome alcohol, you need to overcome tobacco, you, there's some habit that you really need to overcome, and I'll give you some material for that. So we're going to dismiss the meeting. I'm going to ask those of you that are going out tonight, usually we visit here for a long time, but please just go out quietly because I'm going to try to be here with those that want help for tobacco, alcohol, any other habits of your life, anything that's addictive habit that you feel you need help with. Good night. God bless you as you go. Those that are going to stay, just come right up here, and we'll be with you. Thank you.